You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 192 of Healthy Critters Radio on the Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you twice a month by Biostar US, and you can find them online at biostarus.com. On today's show, we share our selection of holiday gifts for horse and dog owners. Critter of the show is the toucan bird, and in Critter Nutrition, it's the tales of past Christmases with animals. Join us! I'm Coach Jen. I'm Tigger. (laughs) And you will notice that there's a missing voice. Yes. She's not here today. She's AWOL. And we will miss her. Yes, we will. We will miss her. So we are going to carry, we will soldier on. We will channel our inner Churchill and soldier (laughs) on. That's not Patty. (laughs) We have a guest on today's show, don't we? We do. We have Lizzie Meyer who's the canine specialist at Biostar. And she's going to have some great uh, holiday gift ideas for the dog lovers. Ooh, goody. Cause who doesn't want to, who doesn't love, have you noticed it's fun to shop for your pets and oh, stressful the, to shop for the humans? A hundred percent. I think the pets are easy. Pets are so fun to shop for because you know, they're going to love it all. Exactly. <laughs> Although. <clears throat> Back in the day when we had our dogs, you do occasionally buy the dog treat or dog toy that the dog says, uh, no. Or that gives them an upset stomach. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that was, yeah, that was a pickles thing. Yeah, everything we gave her gave her an upset stomach. That was awful. Have you ever fed, what are they called? Uh, yak. Shoes, yep. Yak, it's a, it's a. It's like hard cheese like stuff. Yeah, it's yak cheese. Have you ever used those? Yes, I have only one dog that likes it. It's the puppy Kenobi. And he gets on but well with them? He seems to now when they get really small, then I take them away. Yeah, because they'll suck them in. Yeah, and get exactly. Them stuck. Yeah. Exactly. Pickles loved them, but she, and actually, Gloria, our previous Greyhound before Pickles, had the same problem. She would shatter them. Is that possible? They would shatter them. They would get a hold of them and they would snap. Whoa. Yeah. So we couldn't give those to either of our two greyhounds. Pick Glory, our last greyhound, who was technically a lurcher. She wasn't a greyhound because she was half greyhound and half other hunting breed. We're not sure which one. Ah. That makes her a lurcher. Uh, she was an extremely aggressive chewer when we got her. She was probably two years old or so and a regular. Crunchy bone or a leather chew. Oh my God, I gave her leather chews. Yes, we gave her leather chews. She would destroy those in moments. Oh, and yeah. she would she would try to swallow the giant chunks of it. So we had a real steep lead, learning curve because all of our other greyhounds were very gentle chewers. And we oh. ended up getting her antlers that worked really well. Yeah. He Kenobi um will will take an antler out of the toy box because mm-hmm. that's where I put them. And you know, he'll grind on them, but they don't hold his attention very long. I don't think the antler has much. They don't smell anything and, and they don't taste. taste anything. I think that's the hard part with an antler. Yeah. If, I think if you have a dog that is choose be like the, because they like to consume, but also choose because they're stressed, probably antlers are more appealing because all of our greyhounds universally, they can be aggressive chewers. Whatever they're chewing, it's because they want to eat it and swallow it as quickly as possible. Yeah. So greyhounds are, at least in our experience, are big swallowers. Everything goes down whole. <laughs> as a matter of fact, Pickles ate a glove. I remember that. Um, she found herself a leather work glove and consumed it. Oh. Yes. Uh, she had she had torn off a couple of the fingers, and I only knew this happened because there was one finger left. 
So I got to experience the uh, instant effects of giving your dog peroxide. <laughs> yep. Makes them throw up. <laughs> Instantaneously. But it was either that or haul her off the vet and spend a few thousand dollars. And she had literally just eaten it. So it, out it went. That's This is such an interesting conversation. Look where we've gone. Throwing up, vomiting dogs. <laughs> Just a day in the life of a dog owner. A day in the life of a dog owner, is it not? Uh, hey, I want to give a shout out to something. Yeah. A friend of mine sent me, has nothing to do with dogs. This is for the human critter. Mm -hmm. Sent me a gift package today. Yeah. And she had told me ahead of time, as soon as it arrives, open it. Da, da, da. It's from a company called Cold Hollow Cider Mill. And they're in Vermont. And it included this half gallon of apple cider. <laughs> now, I really like apple cider. But generally, the apple cider that you get in a grocery store just isn't up to snuff. It's this, yes, it's frequently pasteurized. So it's yes. kind of blah. Yeah. This is the most delicious cider. I'm mm. on my second cup. Ooh, look at you. And it just arrived at four o'clock this afternoon. Interesting. But, oh, it is. And they have a, a marvelous catalog of, I, I listen to this now. <laughs> um, the foodie shouldn't be so fascinated, but they have donuts i just saw that i want the donut infused with fresh cider can i have four dozen please uh, have yeah. a four dozen button oh that's lovely so uh yeah that's a great gift idea great gift idea for the human Absolutely. and i'm at the point where i would rather have a, a food item as a gift Really, then you know a Chotsky or. Well, you have to have a place to put things, and yes. I've 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 come to that same realization, in that a consumable gift can be really lovely because you can consume, can consume it and enjoy it, and think of the person who gave it to you. But Absolutely. Then you don't have to figure out where to put it. Feel where to put it? About regifting it, or, dust or, it, or dusting it. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or any of those things. So or any of those things. I, I'm I, I really she also included they they make their own hot chocolate with maple. It's a maple hot cocoa mix. I'm gonna have to spend some time on cold hollow cider mill. They are not yes. sponsoring this show, but they should. Nope. So yes. anybody we'll, listening we'll from contact. Cold Hollow? Yeah. Where to find me, Thank you. Network.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But that is interesting. And now when you buy, oh, go back over here. There we go. So I see I you've got me all sidetracked. I was going to ask you a question, and now we gotten all sidetracked. <laughs> well, ask you, away. Ask away. Whenever you go shopping. Are you a do it a little bit all year long? Do it right before Christmas? Do it the day after Christmas? How what is your shopping habit for Christmas? I everything is done by October. Oh, you're just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I spread it out first of all so that it doesn't hit the bank account all at once. That's important. And I'm a really big fan of Kickstarter. Oh, yes. You go in and get in and you find the new Kickstarters and yeah. And, and you're supporting entrepreneurs that have cool ideas. And, you know, very often they're rather unique mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get lucky and it arrives before Christmas. Sometimes you're unlucky like me this year. And two things, two of the three things will not arrive till January. Because of production issues and data. Yeah. And, you know, you know that. Well, because it's a Kickstarter. Those things are going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I I really like the idea of supporting small companies, especially if they're innovative and have great ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. generally you have to, you know, get into a I'll start looking at Kickstarter in January again. Cool. 
There and you I've, go. I've gotten some very cool things from from them. So what do you do? Are you a last minute? Are you a planner? I am so last minute. And I lean heavy into the gift gift gift, gift card. Ah. I'm, I'm a terrible gift buyer. No creativity. Really? I, oh, I'm terrible. I'm just terrible. Unless somebody says, I want a, I'm kind of, you're going to get a gift card. <laughs> so what do you do about Glenn? Glenn gets himself everything he wants when he wants it. He's the worst person in the world to buy for. <laughs> this this year, we bought one another two acres of or five acres of land. <laughs> well, that's a big Christmas present. That's a big Christmas present. Uh, we're just gonna we're gonna take a little vacation between Christmas and New Year's because the company shuts down. And ah. every year that tends to be sort of our Christmas gift to each other as we take a little vacation. This year we're going to do a cruise because it's really super, super simple and we don't have to think about it. Uh, so we've gotten, again, we've both gotten to that point where you can only have so much stuff. Yeah. So our gifts tend to be experiences, except when they're land. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I love, I and yes, I love the idea of, of uh, donuts. So for your horses, were when you were actively competing, did you get your horses Christmas presents? Uh, sort of, kind of. <laughs> I got the, I, I get them Christmas presents because I want it for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They really, I, I, they would they really just make out a, their list and yeah, say, you know, yeah. 50 pounds of carrots. <laughs> yes. They would really rather have an extra flake or two of alfalfa. That's great. Christmas. I, I did. I did always make a Christmas mash for them. Oh, did you? What was in your Christmas mash? So it was usually oat bran, not wheat bran. Um, and carrots, apples, uh, I got exotic for a while, did mangoes and papayas, um, and, you know, really hot water. I don't, I don't remember adding any sugar because the, you know, the, oh, I added blueberries. Oh, really? I didn't know horses yeah. could have blueberries. Oh, they, they love them. I didn't know. And. So and I'd make it in the house so it would still stay warm and added the really, really good hot water and then run it out to the mm -hmm. barn in buckets. Yeah. yeah, we always we always made mashes for Christmas too. And it, yeah. ours was very standard with the carrots and apples. That was pretty much this the standard thing. And the dieting horses in the barn, which were most of mine, would get a tablespoon of sweet feed. That was the special treat. Oh God. <laughs> a friend of mine puts peppermints in. Oh yeah, peppermints. I didn't do the peppermints because they tended to melt. Yes, I yeah. didn't put. I don't put. I didn't. I did not put peppermints in. But in retrospect, I kind of think, well, that would have been fun. That you know, been add fun. some peppermints. Peppermints were not a big deal. In no, our, they weren't our, in our barn. That we were more of a carrot and apple. Carrot, kind of apple, barn. and sugar cubes. Sugar we cubes. Did, we did sugar cubes occasionally. Yeah, occasionally. Um, but it was more than likely either a carrot or an apple, or more most likely the core of the apple or the oh, end yes. of the carrot. Oh, for because sure. I ate the rest. Yes. <laughs> and I had a couple of horses. I, I grew carrots for several years in the garden. And um some hated the greens, and others were like, give me the green. I'll eat the greens before I eat the carrot carrot. Interesting. Uh-huh. And yeah. greens are kind of bitter. Yeah. yeah. They're not sweet. Yeah. Interesting. The horses are funny. I've had horses that I've taken care of that would only eat one species of apple. Wow. Yes. There was, we had one that we took care of. Uh, Shiloh's Market. Freddie was his name. He would eat Rome apples and only oh. Rome apples. Oh, my God. Red Delicious. Nope. Golden Delicious. Wow. No nope. Macintosh. No Macintosh. No Granny Smith. Uh-uh. Had to be a Rome apple. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I developed a real affection for Rome apples because the owner would bring over bushels of seconds from the local uh, orchard. So we'd have bushels of Rome apples in the, in the tack room. And I was a poor farm person working for 25 cents an hour. So I ate a lot of those Rome apples. <laughs> 
And I, I like them to this day, but they're harder to find. They're not there. I think they've gone out of style. Yeah. It's hard to find a Rome apple. I bet you'd find them in New York state. Cause that's really where they came yeah, from. We, yeah. Florida's not a great food. State. Yeah. No, no, we, we import everything. We don't, we don't even grow oranges here anymore. So everything has to come in from elsewhere. And you do grow much, tomatoes though. We do grow tomatoes and strawberries. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so when they're in season, we get to have those, but other than that, everything comes from elsewhere. So we pretty much get gallows and reds and red, green, delicious. Not even green, deli- the, the yellow delicious, even red delicious, gala. That's about it. Wow. Fuji. We'll get some Fujis. Yeah, I do like Fuji. Yeah. Yeah. I like gala better than Fuji. I was real big on Fujis and now I'm on the gala. But anyhow, oh. I digress about apples. But uh, before we get too far into apples and things like that, we need to have Lizzie come on and yes. chit chat about gifts, gifts because, hello, it's the season. Our roundtable today is sharing our selection of holiday gifts for horse owners and dog owners. And helping me with this task is not only Jen, but uh, Lizzie Meyer, who is Biostar's canine specialist. So she's going to handle the dog portion and Jen and I are going to handle the equine portion. So welcome, Lizzie. Thank you. This will be fun. This will be fun. (laughs) So I'm going to start with some horse owner suggestions. And I found this company called Barney, B-A-R-N-E-R-Y dot D-E, which is either Denmark or Germany uh anyway they won the spoda award for best new product and it's a magnetic bridle holder and it's really cool you don't need screws you don't need anything to put it on you just need something that the magnet can attach to like another piece of metal i was thinking like the very popular tack trunks that are made of metal that you wheel around they're tall they're european this would be perfect um and you and so you can move them so you could put them in the spot put them for your halter your bridle then if you move your horse or go somewhere else all you do is just pull it off no screws no glues no nothing so i i thought it was ingenious and they've got about a gazillion colors even pink <laughs> You can get sparkling green. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of cool. Wow. I, I I personally like the sparkling purple. I think that adds a little something. Um, the neon pink is a little bit too much for me, but um, I think sparkling black, uh, especially for dressage people, is like right up their alley. I like the neon pink because you, re- you can remember to take it back down with you. Because <laughs> I'd be the one to stick it on the wall because they'll stick to the, the metal bars on the stalls. Yeah. Uh, I'd stick it on the wall and then forget to take it back down. Oh. That's me. Yeah. There you go. Cool. So it's 48 euros. Um I I can't do a conversion, but I would say it's in the 50, 50, 60 bucks range. And it's a very unique product, and I thought it would make a wonderful gift. Very clever. I, yeah, it's a really cool idea. Um, I ran across a person's blog who I think has has really got some great ideas um, about gift giving to horse owners. And her suggestion was, instead of buying something, make a a little gift certificate and offer like, to clean your friend, the recipient's tack for a day or a week or polish their boots or pay for a lesson or, you know, this is good for one free lesson with your favorite trainer. Um, I really like this idea because it, 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 it's so personal. I mean, somebody who is a great boot polisher 
themselves, you probably wouldn't want to offer to do it because then you'd never do it as well as they did. But by offering them something like doing their lawn, doing their horse laundry or getting, taking their blankets out for laundry, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I would have loved to have that kind of gift. <laughs> I, I, I think it shows thought and, and, and is very personal and it's not about just buying stuff. Cool. Pretty creative. Yeah, she's yeah. a better gift giver than I am. Yeah. Who is? You are. I'm not I a good am. gift giver. I'm just not I, I'm just not very creative. <laughs> but but it imagine if you uh, one of your riding friends that you wanted to wish happy holidays to, I'm sure you could think of something that you could do for them that they would appreciate. Yeah, I remember doing that as a as a a broke tween. We would create little gift certificates. You know, you would give it to your best friend that I'll clean your stall every Saturday and, and that kind of stuff. And that is a lot of fun to do. And oh, so very, very welcome. For example, you give them a gift certificate on pick a holiday that you'll clean, you'll do the barn chores for them. Yeah. And, and stuff like that. Yeah. That's so appreciated. And it's, it's so it's, appreciated. It's, and it's really fun to create now that you have all these nifty online tools, you can create really fun little gift certificates too. Oh, yeah. So I thought those were those are really great ideas. Do you have anything, Jen, on the horse side, a cool product? Um, subscriptions to online education sources. Ooh. There are many, 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 many reputable trainers out there who have online content that's behind a paywall. That's true. And it's been my experience that the paywall is usually pretty low. Uh, it's, you know, $25 or less for a significant amount of material. So that's a great one. Uh, another one might be to uh, pay for an audit at a clinic. Maybe your friend, you, somebody that's on your list has always wanted to go to a clinic with X, Y, or Z. Well, yeah. maybe your budget doesn't stretch to riding the clinic, but you can get them the auditor ticket because you can learn a whole Great lot. Great idea. Auditing. Yep. There you go. Uh, you can get them a gallon of liquid coconut oil because, because it is the second most useful thing on God's green earth after petroleum. That is for sure. <laughs> that is for sure. I have 101 fall- uses. Number one use, 101 uses. Uh, something I have fallen in love with recently are, and this happened during COVID, the little canisters of antibacterial wipes that you get for cleaning countertops and and surfaces, pop up cleaning stuff. You can get them for all-purpose cleaning. You can get them antibacterial. You can get them for tack cleaning. They make them in a little pop top. I think it's Weaver that makes one of those. Wow. Um, Paw wipes. You can get giant packages of paw wipes for dogs. And I know that we're talking about horses, but guess what? Those things work a treat on horses. Really? They are great on horses. I found a whole bunch of them on sale at Best Buy or one of the discount stores. And they were on sale for like 3 or $4 for a giant package. So I got myself several of those. And I am totally in love because especially in the wintertime, if you have a horse who isn't clipped, you curry the horse, you brush the horse, the horse still looks and feels filthy. Icky, yeah. Icky. And that wipe, you particularly where the tack is going to be, you can wipe it off and it helps to take that layer of dirt off the Thanks. hair so you're not taking dirt and grinding wow. into the hair even more. And after you're done riding, if uh, if washing the horse off is not an option, which is off the case, especially in wintertime, they're super handy for cleaning them up after, up after they cool off. It even gets some of the dirt out of their tail. So keep an eye out for sales on paw wipes. They come in giant packages. They are da bomb. If you are clever and crafty, you can make your own. There are a million and one recipes online for DIY uh, wipes, baby wipes. I use the ones that are listed as a baby wipe recipe. Super simple. They usually have three or four ingredients. And you can get yourself the 
you can get by the cardboard box of, they call it a box of rags, but they're not rags. They're usually super duper paper towels. You get that big box and it has a dispenser in it. All you do is open the box, take the, the lump of towels out, set it aside, put a sturdy plastic bag in the box. Now put the towels back in the box and then tape the back that box back shut, back shut again. And then you put your liquid recipe, whatever you picked out, you pour it in there and voila, oh, you wow. have, have a dispenser. Yeah. Oh, Darn that's very handy. cool. Very handy. If you <laughs> if you're a recycler, you can do the exact same thing with towels. You can buy bulk rags, and they're just mm-hmm. basically about the size of a hand towel baby. But they're a really inexpensive, lumpy, rough cotton that you would see cleaning people use like at a hotel or something. You can buy big packs of those. You put them in a big Tupperware. You put your cleaning stuff in there. You use you use it up till it's gross. You throw it in the laundry. When they're all you they're all dirty, you throw them in the washing machine, wash them, and do it again. And then you don't have to throw them away. That is a great tip. <laughs> and you know it would be cool if you're gonna give that as a as a gift. You just you know make a nice little card with the recipe. With the recipe, so it can be refilled, and it's easy, yeah. simple stuff. It'll be baby oil and witch hazel and lavender oil and really or white vinegar depending on the recipe you use Uh, so it's really easy stuff inexpensive and if you make smaller containers of it with like a shoebox size tupperware and half a dozen or so rags inside of it really inexpensive way to make a whole bunch of gifts that's very cool lizzie what have you yeah. got for the dog owners? I have I, some of these double for cats too. Oh, good, Ooh, cool. Which is a bonus. Um, so I've got I've got co- kind of a selection because it can be hard to find a great gift for a dog person that kind of has a lot of stuff already, or their dog is kind of well outfitted to begin with. And I would say I I love enrichment toys. And I think this is a great opportunity to introduce someone to the Westpaw Topple, which is um, an enrichment toy that you can stuff with a variety of different foods. Their website has a million ideas, Um, but it gives the dog something to do. They can be frozen, they're dishwasher safe on the upper rack. And if your dog likes them, you can basically bank them in the freezer and always have something ready to go. If you have one of these Brainiac dogs that just needs a job while you're working on something. So this is like a gift of peace, essentially. (laughs) I don't think I could make it through uh, Aussie adolescent or juvenile or, or puppy (laughs) without a freezer full of topples and different licky mat type devices. So I'm I'm a fan of the topples. Um, their website's great, and then I also am a sucker for something called the Mine Pet Platter. And the Mine Pet Platter again has a great, well, uh, well thought out website. That it's it's basically like a it's a cellulose material. It looks like a cutting board shaped like a dog bone with lots of little scoops and ridges and little valleys in it around the edge. And the idea is that the dog gets to eat in a less stressful way. Um, There's a whole description on the website how this works. I will not get into that right now, but they're they're actually they actually lower stress for dogs and they also i have discovered they do freeze well um at you know with with different um you know spreadable treats in there is like a big licking enrichment mat um but i do like feeding off of them they're dishwasher safe you can feed all kinds of food off of them and it puts the dog in a more correct posture um, that's more relaxing when they're eating. It's very. Can you, cool. can you explain why it's better to use a mine mat than a bowl? A food my, bowl? 
Yes, the the website does the best job, but my understanding is that first of all, when the dog's nose is in the bowl, um, first of all, it's hearing lots of noise because there's always clinking on the floor. It limits their vision also because they're kind of in tunnel vision looking down at the bowl and they're having to scoop with their jaw and their tongue along the edges of the bowl versus on something flat that has texture to it. Mm-hmm. And the the platter type feeder allows the dog, like you don't want to put this in the corner of the kitchen. You want to put this in more of a wide open space because the dog in nature will put its head down on whatever it's eating. And it, it will kind of walk a circle around it. If you can imagine them, you know, eating prey they'll kind of wander around it or they'll kind of pivot around it. Um, And they can also see 360 degrees because their head is not in something or partially in something. So this decreases stress and also their spine elongates. They don't have all this tension in their neck. Um, their, Their posture is much less stressed than eating out of a bowl. And truth be told, I did not believe this when I got one a few years ago. I kind of thought, I I need to see this to believe it. And feeding multiple dogs, I will say this has definitely taken a lot of stress out of feeding time. I just spread them out. Nobody's in a corner. And um, they they can also self-select. So you can put, you know, whatever you feed, if you're feeding something different, you can put, you know, components in one corner, or you can, you know, spread something out in another area, or you, you know, you can kind of see what does your dog really want to eat? Because I think a lot of us just get in the habit of just mixing up a bunch of stuff in a bowl. And they don't really have a, you know, much of a say in what they're eating or not, they can either eat it, be picky or not eat it at all. Right? Right. But on the platter, it's it's pretty cool because you get to see, well, he really likes this type of food or if you're doing like homemade or raw or something, they like this part, but not this part. So it gives you information, um, which I think is cool. And that also kind of honors the dog being able to self-select to a degree. So um, I, I like him for a lot of reasons. And I think, you know, uh, Carol Smeha, she's the owner. She's got a whole description of exactly why she's designed it this way with the different scoops in the middle of the, the bone shape and with the specific like trough around the perimeter um, and what that simulates for the dog. And the colors are colors that dogs can see. And if you're feeding multiple dogs, they actually can identify the color that is there plate, which gives them a sense of security. It's pretty cool. Go to the website. That's my best advice. I'm not the expert in the pet platter, but I really like them. The only other caution I will say, I have very slippery floors. So I'd recommend putting them on a, like a non-slip mat just so they don't move around as much. So um, that's the, the platter idea. Um, I have a couple more ideas if if you need any. Yes, please. Hey, I'm with Jen on the education. Um, I I love cooking for the dogs. I love making food for cats. I mean, I just love being in the kitchen. Um, One of my favorite people, Dr. Judy Morgan, she has a holiday cookbook. It's like $6.99 or something. It is worth it. There are so many great health, super healthy treat recipes that you could totally make and gift to your, your dog friends. Um, there are like, there's like a holiday stew recipe. There's uh, a dog friendly, like a uh, fruit cake. Uh, I'm not going to give it all away, but anyway, it's, it's an amazing little cookbook. Um, and you can just get that on her uh, website in the store. It's very easy to find. So I'd that would be naturally healthy pets. Yes. Go to Naturally Healthy Pets and you'll find the cookbook. Yeah, in the store. It's it's a, an inexpensive, great gift. Um, I'm making some of the recipes. I, I'm so far very impressed. Um, and then as far as like ready-to-go treats, if baking is not your thing, um, 
our treats, so the, the dog star, um, dehydrated, you know, beef liver treats. Um, I think those are always a good gift. Um, if the dog is sensitive to beef or flax, which does happen, I like uh, Farmhounds. Um, that's a company that does a lot of, um, they support regenerative and sustainable agriculture. And they use a lot of very interesting organ meats and they dehydrate everything. There's a variety of options. The website's very um uh, it, it will pull you in. It's so curiosity uh, provoking. I will leave that at that. Um, and then the the last treat that even really sensitive dogs, you can always find an option is green juju. These are freeze dried. They're small. So great for people with puppies or they're doing a lot of training or you're just having to use a lot of um, treats. I will say these are very clean. They're very high value. and um, they do have a lot of options for maybe more sensitive animals that can't have, you know, beef or, or flax, et cetera. Um, so those are, those are some really great options for healthy treats. And my last, my last great gift idea, <laughs> great for people with puppies, especially, but they're, Finding a dog toy that your dog can actually carry around and, you know, you, that you can actually have interactive play with is not easy if you're looking for like a synthetic chemical free type, you know, non-toxic made in the U.S. type toy. I, I've really looked for these toys because what goes in their mouth, you know, it's it's all it all could be absorbed. So I like this company. I found them on Etsy long ago. They have dog and cat toys. They're both excellent quality. And it's called Perfect Play, per like the cat. Perfect Play on Etsy. And these are hemp. They're made out of hemp. And they have all different like animal shapes. They have um, like organic cotton, like flannelly tug toys last time I checked. They have some that have catnip. Um, and some that are wool, but they don't use any gross chemicals. The store owner's wonderful. She's actually helped me a few times over the years. And um, and I know there are a lot of cat people that have a hard time finding clean cat toys and can definitely find them at this place. Yeah, and clean she, cat toys is even harder than clean dog toys. I think yeah. right there. Yeah. Harder. And I think she's got some with organic catnip, which is great. So I would recommend her store. And that's that's the best I've got. Oh, those are great, Lizzie. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> We're glad to have you here on our show, the last show that we get to chat with each other before the big holiday hits. Oh. It's, we went, Glenn and I went to a concert the other night, a holiday concert, and that got me thinking. Do you, uh, some dogs like to sing along when their servants play music in the house. Do you like to sing along? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm a little bit shocked that Glenn was allowed in a public event. <laughs> Did they require that he be silent? It was in the evening, so he was very sleepy. Okay. Yes. Well, so he yes. behaved himself, yes. Okay. Yes. Well, hmm. any the way. Um, I tend to do more of my contributions in the car. So when oh, you like to sing along with the car music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the human is tired, she has a habit of playing music very loudly and singing along. Sometimes she does not even play the music. She just sings her songs. Mm. And I contribute to that. You contribute to that. Do you have a particular style of music that you prefer to sing to? I'm an excellent accompanist to the Bruce Springsteen. Oh, you're a real fan of the Springsteen, are you? 
divorce. Oh, <laughs> very interesting. Do you do you care at all to sing with holiday Christmas carols? I do a stunning rendition of Silent Night, which I think is apropos. <laughs> Appropriate. W- would you be willing to do maybe just one verse for us? Oh, for sure. Please do. Silent night. Oh, night. Oh, all is right. Is that enough for you? That was beautiful. <laughs> Jesus. I know. I'm excellent at singing. Thank you very much. That was quite lovely. Now, mm. the other question we have for you today, since we're talking a lot about gifts for the servants of dogs and cats, We're going to flip it around a little bit. What would you like to get for your servant for Christmas? A job. (laughs) But if she has a job, she won't be able to work. She won't be able to to wait on you as much. Technically, she claims she has a job, but I don't feel her salary is sufficient to my needs. So I would like her to get a better paying job. (gasps) You would like her to get a raise for Christmas. A big raise. I see. There we go. She needs to get a big raise. Well, what you need to do is have her put on the TV set um, the Muppets Christmas Carol. Oh, and at the very end of Muppets Christmas Carol, Cratchit gets a raise. So make sure that you point her in the direction of the TV and make sure she's paying attention at that point, And maybe she'll get the hint. The problem with her is that she's not very competent. So who would give her money? Well, I'm not saying Bob Cratchit did a good job at his job, but he did get a raise. He did. Yeah. there are. God bless us, everyone. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> lots of humans get raises and they're really not very good at their jobs. Yep. Well, then perhaps she's in excellent company. There we go. <laughs> Well, speaking of excellent company, thank you very much, Hedwig, for spending a little time with us this afternoon. And you have a great evening. We'll talk to you again in the new year. Thanks, Hedy. Bye-bye. The critter of the show today is the toucan. One of my absolutely favorite birds. I think I fell in love with it when I was a little kid. It might have something to do with Fruit Loops. But anyway, I just think they're marvelously cool looking birds. So the toucan family is over 40 different species, which is interesting. The largest toucan is the toco toucan. It's that's the one measured, that's in the cereal box, right? The largest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It measures up to 24 inches in length. Now, the smallest toucan is a toucanette. Of course it is. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and it measures 12.5 inches in length. Um, they're, the toucan's large, colorful bills can be four times the size of their head. Wow. I know. They use their beak to reach food far out on branches or deep into tree cavities. Finding and catching food is aided by a toucan's long tongue which can measure up to six inches. Wow. Aside from gathering food, their infamous beak may be used to attract potential mates and scare away predators. A toucan's colorful feathers provide camouflage in their tropical habitat, where they are able to blend in with colorful plants and vegetation. They are more often to find sitting in trees than flying. They rarely spend any time on the ground in the tropical forest. They're primarily fruitivores, meaning they feed mostly on raw fruits or succulent fruit-like produce of plants, such as roots, shoots, nuts, and seeds. They begin their day with early morning visits to fruiting trees in their home area, before making longer journeys in search of new fruit sites. 
They're also known to catch insects, small reptiles, bird eggs, and fish. Their large bill has serrated edges, which can help them catch, grasp, and even skin whatever they might be eating. They can peel their own oranges? Yes! Toucans can be found high in the rainforest canopies, and they rarely make trips to the forest floor. They typically create their nests in hollow-out tree cavities. They're found in Central and South America. They are thought to be monogamous, at least through the breeding season. A female lays one to five eggs. Both the male and female incubate the eggs for 15 to 18 days. Who can reach maturity between three to four years. Now, in their social structure, they travel in flocks of up to 22 individuals. Habitat is the largest threat to toucans. Their rainforest home is being cut down for human use, such as for infrastructure and farmland. Humans are the major threat to toucans as they are still hunted in parts of Central America and the Amazon. They are captured for the pet trade or for use as stuffed trophies to hang on a wall. They have several natural predators, including forest eagles, hawks, owls, boas, jaguars. To protect themselves, toucans use their enormous bill. They also use loud voices to scare off enemies and alert other toucans to dangers. Now, because I find toucans so adorable, I wanted to look up what it's like to own a toucan. Oh, this ought to be good. (laughs) Okay. So, hand-raised babies that are well socialized, make charming, affectionate pets, whereas wild toucans are very challenging to tame. Toucans require a large horizontal cage with lots of perches, as they are very active, curious, and enjoy hopping from perch to perch. Their bill is both powerful and gentle. These birds will entertain themselves by throwing and catching toys and food at the end of their beaks with the greatest of ease. Now, toucans eat a large volume of moist food and are rather messy birds. They have frequent loose and often projectile droppings that may render them less than desirable pets. They do not talk or sing and are only vocal when they want attention or are hungry. They have a pleasant rattle-like tremolo when happy or content. They can be aggressive with other birds and are known to occasionally kill and eat smaller species like canaries and finches. So um, based on that, um, I will not be getting a toucan anytime in the future. I think toucans are best viewed in the wild. They're just there. Yeah, they need to be viewed in the wild. And I just think they are just the most adorable bird. They're, They're so, for me. A, they're incredibly crazy, cool, col- colorful. Yes. But because their shape is so, fa- it's so unique. I love watching them because they look like something from a different planet. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's my favorite. And of course, the fact that they're on the on a Fruit Loop box. I'm sorry, Fruit Loops were one of my favorite cereals growing up. They Me too. Loved Fruit Loops. There we go. And now we're at Critter Nutrition, and I'm going to share tales of past Christmases with animals, which I call the ghosts of Christmas past. One of my favorite holiday movies as a child was the 1951 movie version of A Christmas Carol starring Alastair Sim. If I'm to be visited this year by the ghosts of Christmas past, I'm sure the ghost will highlight some of my memorable holidays with animals, the cat and the Christmas tree. One Christmas Eve, my Maine Coon cat, Hobie, climbed the 11-foot Christmas tree and then decided he wouldn't or couldn't come down. He clung to the bark, alternating between meowing pitifully and howling as the tree swayed with his considerable weight, sending a few fragile ornaments 
to meet their fate on the floor like little glass bombs. We had to get an outside ladder into the house to extract the cat, inadvertently causing more ornaments to shatter. When Hobie finally set his paws on the ground again, he walked to the nearest brightly wrapped present and promptly threw up. (laughs) The Malamute and Eggnog. Many years ago, I had a Malamute named Maymay. I was living with a boyfriend and we decided to have a Christmas party. He made eggnog with rum in it. After drinks, the party moved to the dining area to eat. When I walked back to the living room to get something, there was Maymay moving around the glass coffee table, drinking from one glass of eggnog to the next, lapping it up like it was water. I freaked. I thought she would die of alcohol poisoning. But to my surprise, she, a little glassy eyed and wobbly, just staggered into the bedroom and slept for 10 hours. It was the only time I ever heard her snore. <laughs> the horse in the barn aisle with stockings. Many years ago, I boarded my horse at a barn designed with stalls facing out from the indoor arena. The barn party was held on Christmas Eve day, and the barn o- owner had put up stockings at each, each horse's stall. The owners filled their horse's stocking with carrots, apples, and treats. I get a call from the bar manager on Christmas morning that my horse, Panther, was standing in the barn aisle with a Christmas stocking in his mouth, waving it like a flag. He had managed to get out of his stall, systematically go down the barn aisle, take the stockings off of each door, and consume the contents. He managed to consume 10 candy canes, unknown amounts of apples and carrots, flung a box of domino sugar cubes he had opened into the aisle, and sadly, we found only 10 cubes he didn't eat. The bar manager turned him out in a paddock with hay, and she said he bucked, farted, leaped, and cavorted for a good half hour, refusing to be caught in what must be considered the ultimate sugar high. Fortunately, he never caught from his night of piracy. (laughs) Oh, thank goodness he didn't eat the actual stockings. (laughs) Yes, yes, no, he didn't. (laughs) Christmas Day with Cows, Three Miracles. When my ex-husband and I bought our farm 39 years ago, it came with five cows and a bull. Neither my husband nor I had any cattle experience, so what could go possibly wrong? Our first Christmas at the farm began before light, with our dogs barking unusually loudly and frantically. My husband refused to get up, so I threw on a bathrobe and went to let the dogs out. They ran out into the backyard like hellhounds. I figured it was a raccoon or maybe deer. We had house guests, my husband's brother and his wife, Elaine, from Atlanta. The barking had woken them up, and I assured them they could go back to sleep. I headed for the kitchen to make coffee. Then I heard it. A moo. A moo right by the kitchen window. It was still dark. Oh, crap. Did the cows get out? I threw a coat on, jammed my feet into my trusty bean boots, found a flashlight, and headed outside. Mind you, I am still in my nightgown. There they were, five cows, and somewhere in the dark shadows, one bull. The dogs had stirred the cows up, and I was waving my arms frantically, trying to get the cows out of the backyard and shoo them to the pasture. It did go well. Couldn't put the dogs back in the house because their racket in the house would raise the dead. I managed to get the dogs to come with me to the barn to get a bucket of feed. Did I say it was cold? In the teens. Did I have gloves on? No. As soon as I turned on the lights, the horses started grumbling for their breakfast. So there was a chorus of barks, neighs, and moos, and then the rooster started crowing. I grabbed a bucket, poured some oats and corn into it, at which point one horse started banging on her stall door in anticipation, banging hard. In this cacophony of sounds, I walked towards the cows, shaking the bucket for the cows to come to me while balancing the flashlight. At this point, I can no longer feel my fingers. The cows start moving towards me. The dogs try to herd them, although the dogs are not herding breeds. One is the lab mix, the other a husky mix, and the third is a hound. The back door opens, and I hope it is my husband. But no, it's my sister-in-law, Elaine, who is a city girl and finds being in the country rather frightening. She's in her pajamas and slippers. Can I help, she asks. No, I lie. I've got it covered. Nothing could be further from the truth. The bull just looks at me, doesn't move, doesn't follow the cows. I keep shaking the bucket, walking backwards, then turning forward so I know where I'm going. 
The cows follow me. I am cold in places I didn't think could get cold. The cows pick up the pace and now I run to the gate because being stampeded by a herd of cows just isn't what I had in mind for Christmas. The gate latch is frozen. I reach into my pockets and pull out a Swiss army knife, several sugar cubes, hay bale twine, and a hoof pick. I throw the cow some feed, beat that latch gate within an inch of its life with a hoof pick, and by some Christmas miracle, it unlocks. I scatter the feed inside the pasture, and the cows willingly come through and start eating. But where is the bull? The bull is munching on some 19th century boxwood bushes, tall as trees, planted not long after the farm was established in 1823. The dogs zero in on the bull. He charges the husky, taking a portion of the boxwood with him. The husky is quick and evades the bull. Meanwhile, the rooster is crowing, the mare is resorted to stall kicking, the cows are calling for the bull, and the dogs keep barking. And then the second Christmas miracle occurred. Something told me to get into the truck and herd the bull with a vehicle. Yes, that would be the new truck, the dually, which to get around and behind the bull means driving through, yes, you guessed it, the perimeter of boxwood tree bushes. I hear the crunch of the small statuary of a fox I set out by the boxwoods, now crushed under the tires. The branches scrape the truck and break off. I drive over the terrace, catching the wooden picnic table with the right fender. The sky is growing lighter. I can see the gate. Finally, I'm behind the bull. I inch up on him, put the truck in park, and gun the motor. He moves. The truck follows. The cows move move more urgently. He nears the gate. How do I get in front of him to open the gate? I have a panicked vision of him slamming me into the tube gate with his massive head. I get out of the truck and move around the back of it to be on the right side of the truck and closer to the gate latch. And then the third Christmas miracle occurs. Elaine, my sister-in-law, in her flapping bathrobe, comes running towards me, waving her arms and yelling, Bad bull! Bad bull! It spooks the bull and he bolts to the left. I get to the latch and push the gate inward. One cow moves towards the open gate and I throw the empty feed bucket in front of her. The bull turns to the right, sees the open pasture and trots in. I close the gate, hug a lane and walk back to the house to get gloves and a hat so I can feed horses, chickens and throw hay to the cows. In the light of day, I find the section of fence that the cows had busted through. Unfortunately, could not temporarily temporarily repair it with my usual go-to, baling twine and duct tape. Park the truck there to keep the cows in until my husband could replace the boards. To make this memorable Christmas day even more memorable, the hound afforded himself a good roll in the cow plop on the lawn, trotting through the house to show off his new cologne. That was the last Christmas I ever spent with cows. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. And thanks to Biostar US for sponsoring this show, because without Biostar US, we couldn't have this show and we wouldn't have Tigger either. (laughs) For our second episode this month, which posts along about the 25th of December, probably a little early, we are going to gather together our favorite little bits and bobs from past Radiothon appearances by Tigger, Patty, Hedwig, and their guests. (laughs) 